السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم، بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين، وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على أشرف المخلوقين، سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. Just this morning, my either actually this session we had it also on Monday. Probably, I don't know, some brothers probably were not over here, I don't know, because they were busy or they probably did not get the message, but we're trying to cover the, at least the Imam Malik, inshallah. So that's why we had it on Monday and we have it today, inshallah. So very quick, again, a small review about Imam Malik, rahimahullah. We said that uh, he become, or he took the position of fatwa when he was only 17 years old in the Masjid al-Nabawi, on the Rawda al-Sharifa. And he was given a fatwa for almost 74 years in that very special spot. And like he said, 70 of the ulama of Medina, they give him the credit and the ijazah that he could give the fatwa. The fatwa. Now, something that we should really think about it, in Medina to get a position to be the mufti and to be also the scholar in the Masjid al nabawi is not something easy. Because who used to live in Medina, by the way? Right, so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also after him, of course, in the time of Imam Malik, there's the Abna al Sahaba, the children of the Sahaba, the family of the Sahaba, the closest people to the Sahaba, the Ansar and Muhajirin. So for someone to get that position it was not that easy. Plus, I said, for someone to get that position and also to be very demanded by the people for 74 years <clears throat> and people coming from everywhere to ask a question. That was something incredible about Imam Malik, how he was able to handle that, how he was able to actually also to prepare himself and also to follow the need of the generations. You know, for example, what we do right now, over here in this masjid, after 10 years, we will find that we need something completely different. And after another 40, 50 years, again, the audience will be completely different. So for Imam Malik to be able to answer to the needs for all those generations for 74 years, it was something amazing. But let me say it in this way, how Imam Malik was able to attract this audience. And like I said before the last session, he said he was able to attract the people from everywhere, from Iraq, which is Imam Abu Hanifa, from uh, SubhanAllah, from Syria, from uh, Mesar, Egypt, all the way even from Andalus, people are coming. And something very, very actually unique that somebody came all the way from Andalus, from Spain, to travel all the way from Spain at that period of time to Medina, that probably will take you a year or more. So some people used to travel all the way just to uh, acquire knowledge from Imam Malik. But the amazing part that that person came to the halaqa of Imam Malik, rahimahullah, attended the halaqa of Imam Malik, and he asked, he said, people sent me all the way from Spain. I could say a delegation of the ulama and the scholars and probably the khalifa, they sent him and he had so many questions. So he asked him, it looks around probably 60, 60, 60 questions more or less. Imam Malik probably hardly answered to less than 20 questions. So that person was very surprised when he said to him, what about the other ones? He said, I don't know. He said, you are Malik and you say that you don't know? I travel all the way from Spain, and then you are, if you don't know, then who knows? Imam Malik, in all the humbleness, he said to him, I don't know. And go back to the people that they sent you, and tell them that Imam Malik said that he doesn't know. The basic of this, there is a small qaida, a small basic in ilm, say, awwalu al-ilmi an taqoola la adri. The very basic things in ilm is to learn how to say, I don't know. Because whenever you think that you know everything, you're going to start making mistakes. Oh, everything you can answer to it, that is really not the proper way. Let me go back. So now, the humbleness that Imam Malik has in this way. That's number one. Number two, Imam Malik, he based all his madhab in one thing very, very simple and very important. We mentioned last time and we said that he got the fiqh from Abu Bakr or the fiqh of Abu Bakr which is to be a merciful person from Rahma and all that because he's from the Mawali of the family of Banutain which is from 
uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, and also he was a student of Nafi' Mawla Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab. So he was a student of the servant of Abdullah ibn Umar. So he gained the knowledge from two sources, like I mentioned. From Abu Bakr, to be merciful, to be kind, from Umar ibn Khattab, and the fiqh of Umar ibn Khattab, that he was always looking for the maslaha of the Muslims. When, whenever there is maslaha, Umar ibn Khattab would be there, looking for the maslaha for the Muslims. So Imam Malik used to say, wherever or whenever there is maslaha, shara is there. Whenever there is something that will benefit the people, definitely the shara, the sharia, the deen is there. The shara or the deen came for the maslaha of the people to solve the, their problems, not to make it hard for them, not to make it difficult for them. And then I mentioned last time some ayahs about this, like, Allah wants to make it easy for you. He does not want to make it hard for you, subhanAllah. And always uh, Imam Malik rahimahullah also used to remember or to remind the people about the hadith that Rasulullah used to say, or Rasulullah, مَا خُيِّرَ بَيْنَ أَمْرَيْنِ إِلَّا اخْتَارَ أَيْسَرَهُمَا Whenever Rasulullah ﷺ, he had the cho chance to make a choice, not an order. If he had the chance to make a choice between two things, two issues, he will choose the easiest one. Remember. Well, actually not for himself, but for the rahmah of the ummah. Because if it's up to him, let's say for example, for, for him, the ayahs was revealed to him about the tahajjud of the layl and it's a, a must on the Prophet but it's not a must on the ummah so for him he will take the azimah let me explain this for the faqir he's supposed to take the azimah to, to supposed to take the hard one but for the people he's supposed to give them what? the easy one because among the people they are they are uh, weak people sick people uh, they are children, they are women, they are people cannot do it, so you're not supposed always to put the biggest burden on them. When it comes to you, yeah, you do the burden as much as you want. There is actually, subhanAllah, that hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu about even Ramadan, about the salat of taraweeh, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came the first time, the second time, then the third time he didn't come to lead the taraweeh. When he was asked, why not? He said, I was afraid that it become a what? A must on you. So he avoid that as a rahmah for us, not for himself, because he will take the azimah. So the spirit of the madhab of Imam Malik was based on this. Try to make it easy for the people, but only with the dalil. Only with what? With the dalil, with the proof from the Kitab and Sunnah. And we will see also the madhab, it's based on what? He said something very important, very important, he said. The faqih is the person, the faqih, the alim, the scholar, the mufti, the one. He is the one who will try to find a solution for the people with a dalil. Or in faqih, he is the one who will try to find a word or a hadith or a ayah of ibaha. What's ibaha? Of to be something to be permissible. That's what he said. But to say about something haram, everybody knows how to say that. Isn't it? Everyone can say, okay, it's haram. There is no, no hardship. It's haram, it's haram, it's haram. But you see, the faqih is the one who is able to find the ibaha for the people, but with dalil, of course, with a proof, with a hujja, not just like that. So the bedhab of Imam Malik was all based on this, subhanAllah. Now, let me go a little bit. Like we were talking about Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah and about his teachers, and we will see how Imam Malik subhanAllah he acquired the knowledge and how he was subhanAllah so good to his uh, uh, teachers. We said that, if you remember, we said that his mom said to him the first day when she took him to Rabi'ah, Al Ra'i, she said to him, Before you learn from his knowledge, you get to learn from his adab characters, manners, you will see that the characters, the characters of Imam Malik will continue all the time and that will give him some haybah. Everybody when you look at Malik, they, they are scared of Malik, the, the haybah of Malik. Of course he doesn't have any power, but it was just like that, this haybah that's coming from the ilm. Anyway, so the, the first one of the first students, first teachers of Imam Malik, somebody called Ibn Hormel, Ibn Hormuz. Actually, Imam Malik at that time, he was probably 12, 13 years when he was the students of Imam Malik. 
And he used to go to Ibn Hormuz and learn. But after he finished, after Ibn Hormuz will finish his halaqa, Imam Malik will go again to the house of Ibn Hormuz. To his house. The, the, the teacher finished, so he go to his house again, of course. So Ibn Malik, after that, he's not done. So he will go again. Then he will stand at the door of Ibn Hormuz. He is very like shy or he will be so respectful to his teacher he doesn't even knock the door but he said he will make make some noise probably or something that make that that ibn hormuz will feel like there's someone at the door so he will tell he will tell the jari he will tell the servant go knock the door and check the door who is there so she will say oh this is malik he is here again so he will tell her give him some halwa give him some candies or something probably that's what he wants you see though he will say no no I don't want the halwa, I don't want anything of that, but I want uh, the end. I want to learn more from you, subhanAllah. And uh, usually Ibn Hormuz was busy and he doesn't want. So he would tell her, who is there? Who's asking? Say, Malik, okay, let him come. So he would let him come and he would enter. So he used to give his end to Malik. And at a certain period of time, Ibn Hormuz stopped teaching anybody but only Malik. When he was asked about that, why? Why there are so many students, so many uh, other people are looking for the knowledge, he said something very important. He said, look, now I'm becoming very weak. And also my memory is not strong like before. So the only one that I can trust, that you will listen to me, and you will maybe correct me, is Malik, but nobody else. So he was gaining the knowledge from him, subhanAllah. So, uh, the second person also that he was learning from is Nafi', like I mentioned, Nafi', the servant of Abdullah ibn Umar. Nafi', Nafi', okay. Umar al-Khattab, has a son, his name is Abdullah. Abdullah has a servant, his name is Nafi', and he was one, a very, very, very big scholar in Medina at that time. So, uh, Malik, rahimahullah, used to wait also to go to the house of Nafi', subhanAllah. And he used to say, I used to walk on the heat. It used to be very hot, very hot. And I would go at the door of Nafi and I would wait. Until Nafi probably will open the door. He doesn't want to disturb him. Then he said, I will look from far away to the face of Nafi. So if he is smiling, I will come and ask him. But if he, I don't see him that smiling, so I will just go back. Although he was taking all that hardship, but he was still waiting just to get something from him, subhanAllah. The third one, which is very important also in school, is uh, Ibn al-Ashab. And there is a, a unique story about Imam Malik with Ibn al-Ashab, especially about the memorization. Uh, probably you may you may heard about some people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give them some quality of memorization which is different than the others. Like, I may be good in math, but I'm not good in science. I may be good in memorizing the Qur'an, but I may not be good in understanding the Qur'an. So people, they have different quality, different skills. They cannot all be the same. Some are good in basketball, but they are not good in soccer. Right, I'm, right, I'm not. You're not. So anyway, Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he was, he, mashallah, Allah, give him some very good memory. It says that one time he was rushing to the lesson, to the class of uh, Ibn al-Ashab. But he was a little bit kind of late. So when he got there, when he got there, he took his pen and he was writing. So once he finished, Ibn al-Ashab, he said, okay, now today I give you 30 hadiths, 30 hadiths. Imam Malik, he heard the 30 hadiths, but he memorized only 29, by heart, in one jalsa. So after he finished, so he went to Ibn al-Ashab and he said, you mentioned 30 hadiths, but I memorized only 29. So can you give me that hadith? So he said, you memorize only 29? Da'al-ilm. I mean, the is, is, is completely lost. Why? Because he missed one hadith. And that's how the ulama used to be. SubhanAllah. And one time, Imam Malik, because of that, what he did, he was waiting until the day of Eid, the holiday, probably Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Adha. So he went and he said, this is the day that definitely I'm going to see Ibn Asha. He will definitely come back to his house after Salat al-Eid. So he was waiting after until Ibn Ashab came. So he said, what are you waiting for? 
He said, I'm coming to learn. He said, but today is the Eid day. He said, this is the only day that I thought that you're going to be free, but only you can give only for me, subhanAllah. He said, okay, come in. So he entered. He said, what do you want to eat? He said, I'm not coming here for food, but I'm coming only for the ilm, subhanAllah. He said to him, okay, I am going to give you 20 hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the tafsir. Malik said, Allahu Akbar, this is great, subhanAllah. So Ibn Ashab would say, okay, take your pants and papers and start writing. He said, I don't need to. I already swear before that I will not write anything, but I will memorize everything. And that was the habit of Malik, subhanAllah. Another one of the teachers of Imam Malik is Aisha bin to Sa'id bin Abi Waqqas. Sa'id bin Abi Waqqas, he had a daughter, her, nom, her name was Aisha. And actually there's a story of Awaish, there are many Aishas. Talha ibn Ubaidillah has Aisha, but Aisha bin to Sa'id bin Abi Waqqas, she was also a scholar. She learned a lot from her father, Sa'id bin Abi Waqqas. Imam Malik was a student of that woman. Imam Malik also learned from the same source like Imam Abu Hanifa from Ja'far al-Sadiq, the Imam of Ahlul Bayt, if you want, subhanAllah. So you, you realize now how Imam Malik was able to acquire the knowledge and how smart he was and how good memory he had, subhanAllah. One thing also unique about Imam Malik, which is Imam Abu Hanifa also was, and sometimes we don't pay attention to that. The Imam Malik, he was a very handsome person and he used actually to buy some of the most expensive clothes. He would not come out to the people if he doesn't have the best of the clothes and he will, you know, he will brush his beard very well, he will put the perfume, he will look like the best, like he's going to a wedding every day, subhanAllah. And he will eat the good food and all that. And actually, sometimes, uh, or somebody, one of the mutasawwifah, the Sufis, the Zuhad, used to say, you know, these are the word things, we're not supposed to care about it that much. So some of them, they wrote him a, a letter, like complaining. They say, you are putting yourself in the majlis of ilm, and you are teaching the people, and we heard that you are spending this much money on yourself, and on, on your clothes, and on this, and on that, subhanAllah. So he got the letter, so he read it publicly to the old people, and then he wrote back. He said to them, subhanAllah, you said that I do this and I do that and I do that and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me but let me remind you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the Quran in Surah Al-A'raf the ayah قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أُخْرِجَتْ لِعِبَادِهِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّسْقِ قُلْ هِيَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا خَالِصَةً فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا خَالِصَةً يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ so he said to them, the ayah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Qul man harrama zinat Allah. Who made the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala haram? Who said it's haram? Allah did not say it's haram. Allah, he told us to enjoy it. Qul man harrama zinat Allah illati akharaja li'ibadi. He is the one who provides his servant, his ibad with it. Subhanallah. Min al-tayyibati wa al-rizq from all the tayyibat. It could be clothes, it could be food, it could be anything. So that's the base of his, uh, subhanallah. Of his ilm. Uh, Imam Malik, probably I, I will close today with the, something that called the usul of fiqh. And I, I really ask all the young people, especially, of course, everybody is supposed to. There is a science called usul of fiqh. What is usul of fiqh? It tells us some very basic things which is if there is an issue if there is a problem to solve it how you solve it the usul of fiqh says that the first thing that we get to get the answer from is the quran and all the madahib they agree with that the ahnaf the malikiyah the shafi'i and the hanabi that the very first source of the usul of fiqh the hujjah the marati al ihtijaj is the quran the second one is the is the the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, all the madahib, they agree with it. The third one is what? Is the, is the ijma' of the sahaba. Sahaba did something. Abu Bakr, wa Umar, wa Uthman, wa Ali, wa Talha, and so all of that. So if the sahaba did something, we cannot neglect that. We get to follow them. Why? Because these are the best students of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We follow on this. Nobody disagree with this. Imam Malik rahimahullah or Imam Abu Hanifa, both of them are the same. Now comes to the third one.
comes to the third one. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, if you remember where we said, he said, the next one is Qiyas. If I don't find, then I have to use my Aql. I have to use my brain to find the solution. Imam Malik refusing that completely. And he said, no, it's not. He brought another thing, which is he called Amal Ahl al Madina. The Amal of Ahl Madina. He said, you get to see what the people of Medina are doing. For example, if we ask a question about the mesh on the foot, on, on the socks, or on the shoes, if we don't find a hadith, although there is a hadith, but we just put in this, what do we do? If there's no Quran, no hadith, no Sahaba, I will have to check what the people of Medina are doing. If there is an answer from the people of Medina, I will have to stick with it. Imam Abu Malik said what? They asked him why. He said, look, because the deen was revealed in Medina, the Quran was revealed in Medina. Rasulullah lived and died in Medina. The Sahaba were in the Medina. The children of the Sahaba were in the Medina. So the amal, the doing of Ahl Medina is a hujjah that we have to follow. And this is the difference in the furu' between the Ahnaf and the Malikiyah. The Ahnaf, they take the third one or the fourth one as what? As the Qiyas. If there is no such thing, we will. And this is going to be a long discussion between Imam Malik rahimahullah and Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. They are going to have a meeting and they will discuss about this issue. This issue. How Imam Malik put this one first and how Imam Abu Hanifa put the other one first. With respect, of course. With no cursing. But the, let's say, the dialogue between two giants. Between Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa. We will look at that conversation, inshallah, next time. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi If you have any questions or comments, I'll be very happy, inshallah. Yes. Wa alaikum Is it mandatory to follow an Imam before Imam or can just like. Follow? For you, yes. <laughs> For you, yes. Make it very simple. Um, any, any student of knowledge, any student of knowledge, he got to follow one Imam. You got to follow one Imam. You cannot just go by yourself and say, I'm going to learn by myself. No. First, you got to follow an Imam and study through that Imam. And, imam. and once you got to a certain level that you can read and understand by yourself and know what is this and what is that, then in that case, you can start, you can start doing the comparison. But for example, just let's say in this way, uh, I am a student and I am, let's say, 15 years old or 20 years old. Hardly I'm able to understand the Arabic language. So how I'm going to ne uh, neglect all the alimma and I'm going to acquire knowledge by myself? I cannot do that. Any child, he needs a father and mother to help them. And once you are on your feet, then you can walk by yourself. And that's the same thing for the ilm. Once you get to a certain level, yes, if you think you got to the certain level that you can read and understand and make an argument, that inshallah, inshallah you will be one of them. There is no need for us to follow one of those four Imams. So there's, there's nobody who can say that. There's nobody who can say that. Look, any scholar of the world, if he does not have the respect of those four Imams, Abu Hanifa, wa Malik, wa Shafi'i, wa Ahmed, I don't think that person can say about himself he is a scholar at all. Because the ijma of the Ummah, the ijma, all the Ummah, the ulama, the previous time and in our time and all the time, they agree that these four Imams, we got, we got to learn from them. We got to see what they said. In any field, in any field, you want to study anything, you say, okay, let me see what the people said before me and that I would benefit from them. So you cannot say, I can just do it by myself. No, it's not, for many reasons. For example, when I say about Imam Malik, Rahimahullah, Imam Malik, he was very close to Asr al Nubu'a, like Imam Abu Hanifa. He is learning from the Tabi'een, and he knows a lot of things. For example, the book of Imam Malik, which is al muwatta his book of Muwatta. Once you read the book of Muwatta, the narration of the Ahadith, you will find the same Ahadith in Bukhari and Muslim. And majority of the scholars, they say those ahadith are almost 100% sahih. Although the Senate and the way how he narrated the ahadith is not like Imam Bukhari. So there's no way that he can say, I am going to put all the ahadith on the side and I will follow myself. That, that's not possible.
He died when he was 92 or 96 years old. He so at, the age of 12 years he started he, at the age of 17. I mentioned that in the beginning. I said he started going to learn when he was 7 years old. And then he joined, like I mentioned, those teachers. When he was 12, 13 years old. So he stayed with them for almost around 10 years. During these 10 years, he had a very good memory. And 70, 70 scholars, they give him the permission and they said, now you are qualified to do this. It may not look for us in that way, but look, at uh, that time there was no TV, no internet, no iPad, no cell phone. People, they don't have those things that will distract them at all. So you can imagine how much time he was spending in just reading and acquiring knowledge. So that's why in those 10 years, he learned a lot that he was at that level to give that. Yes? Okay.